this is the story of two kings, unrelated by time and place, but they ruled in different eras and from different parts of the country, but united by something unique. And what is interesting is that the connection between them is visible even today. It's there for all of us to see. Firoz Shah Tughlaq ruled over the Delhi Sultanate in the latter half of the 14th century. He came to the throne in 1351. He was a keen builder, which many rulers before him had been too. But what is perhaps different about Firoz Shah is the fact that he had a great interest in the conservation and preservation of old monuments. He repaired the Qutub Minar, for instance, when it was struck by lightning, and added one more story to the magnificent tower. He repaired Alauddin Khilji's tank, which is in the present-day Horse Khas area of Delhi. He built hunting lodges, madrasas, and his fort, Firoz Shah Kotla one side of which overlooked the river Yamuna. His fort and palace complex were part of his city, Firozabad. The city has disappeared today, but Firoz Shah Kotla still stands, and what stands tall in the fort is a stone pillar from the 3rd century BC. This is what you can see on the screen right now. We will be moving to another picture of Firoz Shah Kotla, and this was perhaps taken in the 19th century. This stone pillar was originally built by Emperor Ashok, the ruler of the Mauryan Empire in the 3rd century BC. Emperor Ashok's pillars were lost to history, so to say, because though they were standing in several parts of the country, no one knew what they really were. Many legends were associated with these freestanding stone columns. Some people referred to them as the Lats of Thin from the Mahabharata, for they were so tall and looked so heavy. So when Firoz Shah decided to install not one, but two such pillars in his capital, he did not know he was bringing in a piece of ancient history. It wasn't until 500 years later that the inscriptions on these pillars were deciphered and the somewhat mysterious pillars became national heritage. But we will come to that a little later. For now, let us see what the Sultan of Delhi saw. In 1356, Firoz Shah Tughlaq transported one pillar from Topra in Haryana and another from Meerut in Uttar Pradesh to Delhi. The process of removal of the pillar from Topra has been described by a contemporary author. Let me quote from this detailed and descriptive account. It is long but worth sharing, I think. So here begins the quote. After Sultan Firoz returned from his expedition against Thakta, he often made excursions in the neighborhood of Delhi. In this part of the country, there were two stone columns. One was in the village of Topra, in the district of Sudhora and Khizrabad, at the foot of the hill, the other in the vicinity of the town of Meerut. When Firoz Shah first beheld these columns, he was filled with admiration and resolved to remove them with great care as trophies to Delhi. Khizrabad is 90 coast from Delhi, in the vicinity of the hills. When the Sultan visited the district and saw the column in the village of Topra, he resolved to remove it to Delhi and there erect it as a memorial to future generations. Orders were issued commanding the attendance of all the people dwelling in the neighborhood and all soldiers, both horse and foot. They were ordered to bring all implements and materials suitable for the work. Directions were issued for bringing parcels of semal, which is the silk cotton tree. Quantities of this silk cotton were placed around the column and when the earth at its base was removed, it fell gently over on the bed prepared for it. The cotton was then removed by degrees and after some days, the pillar lay safe upon the ground. Now let me show you the picture of a boat which the pillar, which was used rather to transport the pillar. The pillar was then encased from top to bottom in reeds and raw skin. The pillar was then encased from top to bottom in reeds and raw skin. A carriage with 42 wheels was constructed and ropes were attached to each wheel. Thousands of men hauled at every rope and after great labor and difficulty, the pillar was raised onto the carriage. The carriage was moved and was brought to the banks of the Jamuna. Here the Sultan came to meet it. A number of large boats had been collected. The column was very ingeniously transferred to these boats and was then conducted to Firozabad. At this time, the author of the book was 12 years of age. When the pillar was brought to the palace, 
a building was commenced for its reception near the Jami Masjid, and the most skillful architects and workmen were employed. By degrees, the column was raised to the perpendicular. Large beams were then placed round it as supports until quite a cage of scaffolding was formed. It was then secured in an upright position, straight as an arrow, without the smallest deviation from the perpendicular. A long quote, but with interesting detail, for transporting such a huge pillar and making sure it reached Delhi safely would have required a great deal of care and ingenuity. So this pillar from Topra in Haryana can be seen in Firosha Kotla, which is close to the Jami Masjid, the main mosque of the fort. It stands close to the Jami Masjid, the main mosque of the fort. Now, Firosha also brought another pillar, which was from Merat, and he installed it near his hunting lodge on the ridge. In the 18th century, during the reign of the Mughal Emperor Farooq Siyar, this pillar on the ridge was broken into five pieces due to a gunpowder explosion. It was reinstalled in the 19th century and stands in front of the entrance of the Bara Rao Hindu Hospital on the ridge. Now, when Firosha brought the pillars to Delhi, he noticed the inscriptions on them and was curious about what they meant. Nobody, however, could read these inscriptions. But some people, perhaps to be in the good books of the ruler, offered their own interpretation. They said the inscriptions meant that no one would be able to remove the obelisk from its place till there should arise in the latter days a king named Sultan Firoz. Interesting. Now Sultan Firoz wasn't the only person, wasn't the only ruler rather, who was fascinated by the Ashokan pillars. One such pillar aroused the curiosity of another ruler, the Mughal Emperor Akbar. The Allahabad fort, which we see on the slide right now, the Allahabad fort built by Emperor Akbar in 1578 also has an Ashokan pillar. There is another common issue between the Delhi Topra pillar in Firoz Shah's fort and the Allahabad pillar in Emperor Akbar's fort. Both these pillars also bear inscriptions from later dates. This shows that the kings who ruled much after the Mauryas used these pillars to record their conquests and other deeds. Now we can see this is the pillar which is in the Allahabad fort. In the Delhi Topra pillar, in addition to the original inscriptions, there is an inscription from the Chauhan dynasty which ruled over Delhi in the 12th century AD. The Allahabad pillar contains three sets of inscriptions, three emperors, all belonging to different eras. Ashok Maurya from the 3rd century BC, Samudra Gupta, the Gupta ruler from the 4th century AD, and Jahangir, the Mughal emperor from the 17th century. The Ashokan pillars on the Allahabad, sorry, the Ashokan inscriptions on the Allahabad and the Delhi pillars, along with a couple of other pillars, were pivotal to help decipher the script. James Princess, an English scholar, who documented coins, finally managed to decipher the Brahmi script and to read the inscriptions on the Ashokan pillars in 1837. Let me show you a picture of James Princess. It is indeed interesting to note that when James Princep first deciphered the inscriptions, he thought the pillars were built by a king of Ceylon. As he writes in the Journal of the Asiatic Society of Bengal, I trust that it has been satisfactorily proved that the several pillars of Delhi, Allahabad, were erected under the orders of King Devnam Pier, Pier Dasi of Ceylon, about 300 years before the Christian era. This was because although Princep could read the inscriptions, Emperor Ashok's name was not mentioned in these pillars. The inscriptions talked of a king, Dev Nam Pier, Pier Dasi, meaning beloved of the gods. So let me show you, this is how he presented the paper. So it wasn't until a few months later that Princep was able to identify Dev Nam Pier with the Mauryan Emperor Ashok. He found a cave inscription in which Ashok's grandson and successor, Dashrath, refers to himself as Dev Nam Pier. And additional evidence came from George Turner, an expert in Pali literature, who was in Colombo at that time. He said, and I quote again, 218 years after the beatitude of Buddha was the inauguration of Pier Dasi, who, the grandson of Chandrabhu, and the own son of Bindusar was at that time the Viceroy of Ujjain. So this helped Princep understand that Ashok and 
Priyadasi for the same people. The Ashokan pillars were built mostly in northern India, and as James Princep puts it, the general on object of Dev Nampir's series of edicts is, according to my reading, to proclaim his renunciation of his former faith and his adoption of the Buddhist persuasion, to which wholesome change he invites others from every rank in society by a representation of its great excellency. Although the edicts rarely mention Buddha or Buddhism, the term Dhamma, that is the keystone of Buddha's reform, is constantly used. Most of the pillars built by Emperor Ashok are in places that have some connection with the life of Gautam Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. For instance, there is a pillar in Lumbini, Nepal, that marks the birthplace of Buddha, or Prince Siddharth, as he was then known. There are a few more pillars in Nepal. Otherwise, the majority of these pillars are found in the states of Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, and Haryana. So this is a pillar in Lumbini the birthplace of Prince Siddharth. Ashok ascended the throne in 269 BC. A few years after, he conquered Kaling, present-day Urissa. In the course of this war, a hundred thousand people were killed, and as many as that perished. Seeing the death and destruction, the emperor was struck with remorse and decided to convert to Buddhism, in which non-violence was a basic tenet. Although Buddhism did not become the religion of the Mauryan state, but it spread rapidly because of Emperor Ashok's enthusiasm. And these pillars were one of the means through which the emperor encouraged the people of his empire to adopt Buddhism, the Dhamma mentioned in the pillar inscriptions. Now, as you can see, these pillars are monolithic, they are made of sandstone, and they are smooth and polished. So we'll come to the pillar in Sarnath, which is unfortunately broken. Perhaps all the pillars had capitals, though currently only a few pillars can be seen with capitals. The lion capital, which was once on top of the pillar at Sarnath, is our national emblem. We can see how it looked when it was excavated in 1902. John Marshall, who was then the Director General of the Archaeological Survey of India, has described the lion capital. Lying near the column were the broken pieces of the shaft and a magnificent capital of the well-known Persepolitan type, with four lions above supporting in their midst a stone wheel or dhamma chakra, the symbol of the first law promulgated at Sardath. Both bell and lion are in excellent state of preservation and, the master and masterpieces in point of both style and technique, the finest carvings indeed that India has produced. So let me show you the lion capital as it was found in 1902. The Buddha gave a sermon at the Deer Park in Sarnath. This was called the Dharma Chakra Parivartan, turning of the wheel of law. This was an, an important event in the life of Gautam Buddha, and so Emperor Ashok installed a pillar here. The pillar unfortunately is in pieces at Sarnath, but the lion capital is displayed in the on-site museum, and it looks marvelous and majestic. Now coming to the inscriptions. Here we can see a close-up of the inscriptions. What do they tell us? What was the message that the Mauryan Emperor wanted to convey? The two pillars at Delhi contain more or less the same message. Since the pillar on the ridge was broken, it was decided that a portion of it containing the inscription be sent to Calcutta. Major Pew, who was responsible for sending the fragments to Calcutta, described where and how the column was found. He said, and I quote, this very ancient Hindu pillar was dug out of some ruins near a Bauli and was probably destroyed by the blowing up of a powder magazine, which I understand once existed near the spot. It consists of five pieces. And he was writing to James Princep. So he said, I shall await with some impatience your opinion as to their age and import and whether their date be anterior to those which have been so unexpectedly deciphered on the laps of Firosha and Allahabad. By the time James Princep received the fragments of this pillar, he had already translated the inscriptions on the Delhi Topra and the Allahabad pillars. So he immediately identified the inscriptions as containing the same messages. So what were these messages? Let us read some excerpts of James Princep's translation of the inscription on the Delhi Topra pillar in Firoz Shah Kotla. 
Thus spake the king Devdam Pier Piyadasi. In the 27th year of my anointment, I have caused this religious edict to be published in writing. In religion is the chief excellence, but religion consists in good works. I have caused religious discourses to be preached. I have appointed religious observances that mankind having listened to thereto shall be brought to follow in the right path. There is an inscription that goes around the column. It reads as follows. Moreover, along with the increase of religion, opposition will increase, for which reason I have appointed sermons to be preached, and I have established ordinance of every kind. Along the high roads, I have caused fig trees to be planted, that they may be for shade to animal and men. I have also planted mango trees, and at every half course, I have caused wells to be constructed, and resting places for the night to be erected. The emperor ends by saying, let stone pillars be prepared, and let this edict of religion be engraved thereon, that it may endure unto the remotest ages. So we see an image of a Vaishali pillar, which also contains the inscriptions, and we see a close-up of the capital of the Vaishali pillar. It is one of the pillars which still has capitals and is standing in Vaishali today. So, well, the inscriptions of Ashok have, sorry, so let me just end by saying the same thing, by repeating what the emperor has said. Let stone pillars be prepared and let this edict of religion be engraved thereon, that it may endure unto the remotest ages. Well, it certainly has, hasn't it? Even 3,000 years after these pillars were put up, their message etched in stone. We can still see them and marvel at them. And this is our national emblem on various documents. Thank you.